Magandang umaga, magandang tanghali, magandang hapon, at magandang gabi. Or a very pleasant day to everyone. This is your hour and today we are going to talk about something that's not only interesting but it is about time really that we do some answers. Especially for people who already know the answers but they just refuse to accept it. Sometime last week, somebody sent me a copy of the interview of Andres Bautista, former Commission on Elections Chairman and former PCGG officer. And he was being interviewed by the, um, the, the girl, the lady who made this movie on Imelda Margos, The Kingmaker. I, I'm sure many of you may have watched it already because I think it's on YouTube. Her name is um, Lauren, L Lauren, Lauren Greenfield. I can't even pronounce the name quite well. She produced, uh, I don't know if it's a documentary, it's, a documentary means it's based on documents, isn't it? Or something that's factual. But anyway, she produced something entitled The Kingmaker, and this is about Imelda Romualdez Marcos. And then she and Andres Bautista, they call him Andy as a matter of fact, were interviewed by somebody from the staff of Christian Amampur. And in that interview, I uh, heard um, Bautista saying so many things and also this lady after she has also interviewed Mrs. Marcos and then produced that documentary. In fact, as she was asked why a kingmaker? Why did you call Imelda Marcos a kingmaker? And according to her, well, it's because uh, she wants to bring back to the palace or to Malacanang her family to return to power. But who is it actually that's following? Because Long before uh, 1986 happened, um, Senator Bongo Marcos was already in politics. He was already the vice governor of Ilocos Norte, the home province of his father and also his home province. Um, Aimee Marcos, Miss Aimee Marcos, also was already in politics after she returned from, from exile and she was already in the Senate. She was in Congress and then she was in the Senate. Now she's a senator. So this has nothing to do with uh, Mrs. Marcus trying to put her children there. Her children have their own intent in life, which is, as already um, you know, mentioned so many times, it is to serve the people exactly the way their father has done. So it's not just following the footsteps of their father, but it is actually their intent, especially since they still have a very big following as far as our population is concerned, because you must recall that in the last uh, presidential elections, they call it actually a snap election because Marcos moved the election for the president one year ahead of its actual time. The uh, presidential elections would have been in 1987, but since America pressured him to uh, have an election early on, because they were hoping that by doing so, they could remove him through those uh, to that kind of a technique. So he, well, he said, okay, let's see how this is going to go about because he's positive that the people will vote for him and they did. And we all know the results of those elections. But let me go back to that interview uh, from, the, um, from the program of, uh, one, of the, one of the ladies also of uh, Christiana Mampur. And she was interviewing these two people, Andres Bautista and Lauren Greenfield. Lauren Greenfield, as I said, produced that um, film, The Kingmaker, which is all about Imelda Marcos. Now let's get down to what exactly they talked about from the beginning of that interview. So it was asked uh, of Bautista, what do you think of Imelda Marcos and so forth. And the first thing he mentioned was, well, you could see how extravagant she is because look at the numbers, number of pairs of shoes that she has all 3,000 of them. Para bang itong si Andres Bautista parang pinanganak lang kahapon? Sapagkat alam naman niya, yung 3,000 na mga sapatos na yon ay mga bigay ng mga shoemakers ng Marikina. If he were really good enough to do proper research, and if he looked at those pairs of shoes, nakatago yon sa isang kwarto sa ibaba ng Malacanang nakalagay sa uh, shoe stand 
At kung talagang titingnan mo, ang dami nga, 3,000. Ngunit kung sisaya sa atin mo, bawat isa sa kanila, um, masyadong, pag makikita mo yung iba, are talagang maraming dekorasyon, maraming mga mga palamuti na, ka, uh, na nakalagay doon. Tapos kung makikita nyo yung mga brand, iba-ibang brand, uh, mga mga pangalan ng mga imported uh, shoes, as a matter of fact. Kaya iisipin mo na siguro ito binili. Pero kung titingnan mo yung size ng mga sapatos na yon iba-iba ang size. Merong size 4, may 5, may size 10, may size 8. Ang size ni Mrs. Marcos ay size 9 sa kanyang sapatos. Kaya kung yun ay mga binili ni Mrs. Marcos, if she bought those shoes, then they should have been all the same size. So that's one aspect that people should look into. If she really bought all of those shoes, bakit iba-iba ang size nun? Hindi pala, hindi yun na... Hindi yon ang kanyang size. They should have all been size 9. Secondly, tingnan sana yung ilalim ng sapatos. Hindi ba? Pag nagamit mo na yung sapatos, merong marka na sa ilalim na may konting dumi. Kahit na anong gawin mo, basta nagamit mo na talagang makikita mo at kung hindi may gasgas, ay may dumi na ng konti. Kung titingnan nila yon mga sapatos na yun, malinis. In other words, talagang nilagay sa eskaparate. Those shoes were really displayed there. Why? Why did she keep all those 3,000 pairs of shoes? Ito si Andres Bautista, nagulat. And, and, and he relayed it by saying na ganun ka-extravagant. Ganun ka-extravagant daw si Mrs. Marcos, 3,000 sapatos ang meron siya. That is, you know, it is a very irresponsible way of saying it. As a matter of fact, one of the first interviews of Mrs. Marcos was about those shoes. Anong unang sinagot niya? Thank God, they found shoes, not skeletons. Yan, pag-usapan natin yan, skeletons. They found shoes and not skeletons in my closet. So yung mga sapatos na yon, ilang beses ko na napag-usapan yan at ilang beses na rin na ulit-ulit yan at meron na rin mga ebidensya tungkol dyan. Those pairs of shoes, all 3,000 of them, were given as a gift to Mrs. Marcos by the Marikina Shoe Industry. We have a place here close to, um, well, within Metro Manila, sa Marikina. It's now a city. Uh, during their time, it was just a town. You must remember that during the time of the Marcoses, the metropolitan Manila area was actually composed of 13 towns and four cities. Presently, all of these are now cities except one. It's only Valenzuela that remains as a municipality. All the rest are now cities. At the time, Marikina was just a town, the town of Marikina, and they had a thriving shoe industry, home industry nila as a matter of fact, yun ang, yun ang hanap buhay ng mga tao sa Marikina and Mrs. Marcos uh, looked into this and then she said, magagaling ang ating mga craftsmen our skilled workers are, are very adept, uh, as a matter of fact, nung nakita nga niya ma maganda yung kanilang trabaho ngunit, bakit hindi na lumalaganap yung, yung shoe industry niya, bakit hindi pwede mag-export? Kasi nakita nga niya na ma ma mahusay ang paggagawa, masinop. Uh, very, very, very uh, skilled uh, workers we had there. So what she did was, she invited, and uh, you know, because of her travel, she invited some of those uh, Italian and French and foreign uh, uh, shoemakers to look at the Marikina uh, home industry, if you would call it, the businesses, the small businesses of the people of Mariku Marikina. And they were also surprised to see how, how um, you know, how, uh, how skilled our, our shoemakers were. But there was something uh, missing why, uh, the, you know, why, why the shoes could not be exported or why they could not be of the quality um, of the French or of the Italian. And that was because of the leather, the tanning of the leather. Meron kasing um, method yan na yung, yung balat, hindi lang basta pinapatuyo o ganito, o kung ano man ang ginagawa doon. Merong, merong style ng tanning, yan ang una. Pangalawa, yung, yung type ng leather. Kung baka, kung bata pa yung baka na yung matanda na. Basta it had, had to do with the leather. Sapagkat kung sa paggawa, kayang-kaya ng ating mga, mga skilled workers dyan sa Marikina. So, Tinuruan sila tungkol dyan sa tanning. At ang ginawa ni Mrs. Marcos, tinulungan din sila sa importation ng magagandang leather. At sila na rin ang uh, nakipag... Uh, uh, anong tawag nito? They, they, 
they had a very good uh, working relationship with all of these uh, leading shoemakers in Europe and elsewhere in the world so that they would know exactly how to make the kind of shoes that would be um, of high grade quality that you could export. So, so yun ang nangyari. At sa madaling salita, hindi, hindi nagtagal, talagang umunlad yung ating shoe industry sa Marikina. Marami, lang, marami silang uh, nakuhang order long before, well, you know how it is nowadays, uh, pagsabing made in China or made in India, made in Brazil, made in Mexico, yung mga sapatos. Um, wala pang sinasabi niyang made in the Philippines. Nauna pa tayo, as a matter of fact, uh, sa paggagawa ng mga sapatos na um, may mga pangalan. Hindi ko nababanggitin. But these are foreign names. Um, usually, you buy them in these high-end stores. Mga naka-exhibit yan sa mga malalaking tindahan at mga mahal. Nagawa natin yan. In fact, maraming nakuha sila mga kontrata na gumagawa sila ng mga sapatos. And then sometimes they also give the design that they want this kind if it has to be, for instance, for royalty or for whatever. In other words, lumaganap yung shoe industry sa Marikina. And because of that, tuwing meron silang nagagawa. So whenever it is that they're able to produce a pair of shoes that is part of their export or something that they exhibit overseas, Anything that they're proud of, nagre-regalo sila kay Mrs. Marcos. So for every design or for every pair of shoes that has merited an award abroad and here and uh, that has been part of an export that they uh, already undertook at the time, talagang nag-increase yung kanilang income, lumaki yung industry dyan, nagre-regalo sila. So over the years, umabot nga sa mahigit nga 3,000 eh. Sinasabi nila 3,000 pairs of, but there were even more. So lahat yan nakalagay dun sa escaparate, uh, or the, sh the shelves that was there in one room in Malacanang. And what did they do? Ito mga dilaw talaga, mga kasamahan ni Mrs. Aquino. Sabi nila, wow, tinan mo, uh, you know, Imelda is so frivolous and she's so extravagant and she has 3,000 pairs of shoes. How many can she wear in a day? Tandaan niyo yung ibang sapatos dun, mga high heels pa yan. And never si Mrs. Marcos nagsusuot ng high heels. Naalala nyo na nagliligawan sila, na nakwento ko na ito sa inyo, na nag, nag nililigawan, hindi lang nililigawan. Nung una siyang nakita ni President Marcos, si President Marcos is only a congressman at the time, and he saw uh, Imelda in the canteen of Congress, pero yung sa pag-upo lang niya, mukha talagang matangkad na dalaga. And when he approached her, that's exactly what he asked, kung pwedeng tumayo siya sa glit. Tapos parang sinukat niya yung kanyang shoulders kay Mrs. Mark, kay Imelda at the time. So nakita niya na hindi pala gaano, hindi, hindi mataas sa kanya. So Mrs. Marcus knew this. As a matter of fact, uh, ingat na ingat nga siya, lalo na pagka naglalakad sila halimbawa, especially pag, uh, sa television at saka kinukunan ng, ng retrato, ayaw niyang makikita na parang mas matangkad siya. Okay, President Marcos. Okay, hindi siya nagsusuot ng mga matataas na 3-4 inches na high heels. So it is really impossible na yung mga sapatos na nakita nila sa Malacanang, siya ang nagsusuot nun. Because she does not do this, lahat ng mga kaibigan niya, and everybody knows that in Malacanang. As a matter of fact, karamihan nga na suot niya parang, parang step in in a way. May, may tawag dun eh sa mga, sa mga sinusuot niya nun. Kasi hindi ba nakakimona siya? Parang... Hindi naman bakya eh, pero step in, yun ang, yun ang suot niya. Hindi siya, hindi siya sapatos. First of all, it's comfortable. Second, it's, uh, it, it goes with her attire. And kaya nga, sinasabi ko ito sapagkat kung talagang, hindi lang sa research, pero kung salag, talagang hindi madumi ang isip mo, magtatanong ka siguro, bakit ang tataas nito mga takon na ito? Sinusuot ba ito ni Mrs. Marcos? Kung tingnan mo yung ilalim, hindi naman pala ito gamit. Never used. Kung titingnan mo yung size, hindi naman pala ito yung kanyang size. Kaya you cannot, you cannot even just checking on them, immediately say, look at all the shoes that Mrs. Marcos has. My goodness. And then you have this, how many? 35 years after, you have this person under, who's, uh, anong pangalan to? Andres Bautista. At sasabihin niya, yan, nakita ninyo kung gaano kagasto si Imelda Marcos, 3,000 sapatos yan. It is, you know, it is so unfair to Mrs. Marcos because after all these years, 
this man, matalino naman daw yan, alam na niya siguro kung ano yung mga sapatos na yan. As a matter of fact, you go to Marikina today, they have a museum there. At least yung mga sapatos na, na retrieve nila kasi marami na daw nawala yung sa Malacanang. Yung mga mga natira na mga sapatos na sila rin na nagbigay kay Mrs. Marcos, ginawa nila ng museum sa Marikina. It is there exhibited to show that at one time, during the time of Imelda Marcos, we had a very uh, thriving shoe industry in Barikina. Kaya yun parang rekwerdo nila na once upon a time, talagang kilala sila sa buong mundo at marami silang uh, negosyo na napalaki gawa ng tulong ni Mrs. Marcos. It is there. There is a museum there in Marikina where you have some of these shoes kasi marami na nga nawala exhibited. And you, you can talk to some of them who, who probably are still alive or their sons and daughters who are still in the shoe industry and they will tell you that indeed these were the gifts that they gave to Mrs. Marcos as a token that uh, that pair of shoes for instance uh, has a name brand uh, one of those uh, big names in Europe and they're able to make it and they're able to export it and they're doing that precisely for those companies or for those uh, for those uh, shoe uh, shoe stores that is the story of the shoes kaya itong si Andres Bautista na idudugso niya kaagad sa frivolity ni Mrs. Marcos grabe talaga hindi lang sa nakakahiya sa kanya sapagkat may isip naman siya at pangalawa sa haba ng panahon ngayon nag PCGG pa naman siya meaning he, he was in that first executive order of Mrs. Aquino na nagsabi nga na lahat ng mga ari-arian ng mga Marcoses ay nakaw. And that's exactly how he was trying to sound. As a matter of fact, kasi nasa tail end na nga siya na itong PCGG. And again, I have to repeat this. The Presidential Commission on Good Government, which was created by the Executive Order of Mrs. Aquino, one of the first, Executive Order number 1, number 2, number 12, number 12A. Memoriado ko ng lahat na yan. In other words, Marami nang dumaan dyan. Ang unang-unang naging chairman dyan ay si Jovito Salonga. You will remember, he also became a senator eventually. That was Jovito Salonga. So, siya rin ang, sabi nga, nagsequester. Siya ang kumuha ng lahat-lahat ng kanilang pinagsususpechahan ng mga ari-arian ng mga Marcoses. Because that executive order already declared the Marcoses as thieves. Magnanakaw, nagnakaw sa taong bayan. And so that's exactly what Andres Bautista was talking about. Sabi niya, tina mo, ang yaman-yaman nga nila. Kaya nakabili sila ng apat na building sa New York. And then, uh, parang, not parang, pero pa, he implied, not just implied, but categorically said, na nakaw nga sa taong bayan yung pera na binili. My goodness. You know, the trial of New York was a trial of the century, they say. And the whole world was watching that. Why? Because... Can you imagine a former head of state, Ferdinand Edralin Marcos? He was accused in a New York uh, court courthouse violating an American law because may apat na building siyang binili doon. And the accusation is, yung kanyang gobyerno is a racketeering influence and corrupt organization. Because that's the law na supposedly violate niya. RICO, R-I-C-O, that's the RICO case. Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organization Law. So, tandaan ninyo, matatandaan ninyo yung mga unang pang kwento ko as we started this Rita Gaddis Hour. The first case filed, actually, against the Barcoses under this RICO law was in Los Angeles, sa LA, doon sa court ni Mariana Feltzer. Siya, siya yung district court doon. At uh, ang PCGG, ay nagbigay ng mga dokumento sa Justice Department ng Amerika sapagkat hindi naman pwede na ang mga abogado o ang government ng Philippines magka-file ng case in a foreign court. Mali yun. That is not allowed because under international law, um, your justice system should be the first act of your sovereignty. So kinailangan na ang file ng case nila dito sa Pilipinas. Pero ayaw nilang pabilikin si President Marcos. Because they were filing a criminal case. Can you imagine? Pag nanakaw sa taong bayan, that's theft or graft and corruption, however else you would call it. Under our law, that is a criminal offense. 
So Marcos should have been tried here in the Philippines. Pero ayaw nila. Because also under our law, the person that's accused must be able to be appearing in court every day that the trial is ongoing. That is a requirement. Kailangan, yan ang karapatan niya, na kung sino man ang accuse sa kanya, haharapin niya. Pero ayaw nila. Unang-una, takot sila. Takot sila kay President Marcos kasi mat- magaling na abogado. Pangalawa, natatakot sila na baka yung mga followers ni President Marcos ay eh, talagang andun sila sa courthouse. Alam nila yan. Thirdly, gusto nila na ang Amerika mismo kasi alam nila ang Amerika is the mightiest sword of justice. Yun ang maglilitis. Kaya ang Amerika man naghanap. Naghanap sila ng uh, kanilang batas na pwedeng iparata, ipatong kay President Marcos. So they found the RICO case and that was filed in Los Angeles. Of course, all the documents uh, came from the PCGG you know, and the other documents that they were able to source from America, from the banks, from the Swiss, whatever it is. Basta lahat ng dokumento na meron sila. But, isa lang ang witness na pinresent nila doon. Yung mga dokumento pina, na dinala nila doon, hindi nila ginamit doon sa LA. Ang kanilang ginamit ay mga dyaryo. Philippine Inquirer, lahat yung mga dyaryo na yan, kung saan nakalagay sa mga headlines, Marcos is a thief, Marcos stole so much, Marcos uh, did this, Marcos that, did that. And they, they presented one witness, a certain Fernando. Nakalimutan ko nga yung first name niya eh. Nabit-bit niya yung mga dyaryo na yan para ipakita sa court na si Marcos magnanakaw. Yun. So that was the first case that they filed against Marcos. Si Andres Bautista, he should know this kasi PCGG yan eh. And the first chairman of the PCGG signed some kind of a memorandum of understanding with the assistant uh, Attorney General of America of the Justice Department. Ang pangalan niya, Victoria Tensing. Hanapin niyo yung mga pangalan na sinasabi ko. Just to be able to make sure that what I am saying is actually factual. Victoria Tensing and this uh, Jovito Solonga signed a memorandum of understanding that they can exchange documents back and forth, Philippines and America, for the case against Marcos. So yon. Andres Bautista should know this kasi... PCGG chairman is sa Longa, tapos ito si Bautista naging chairman din. Ng, so you should know the history. So what happened in that case? They lost the case in the in the court of Mariana Feltzer. They lost it. In other words, it was dismissed. Kasi wala nang ebidensya eh. Mga dyaryo ang kanilang pinalabas doon. So nag-appeal. Sabi ko nga, nung nawala yung kaso na yan, nung na, na-dismiss, nag-intercede si Michael Armacos. Tino ba yung Michael Armacos na yan? He was a former ambassador here in the Philippines. At galit na galit yan kay Mrs. Marcos. Ikikwento ko na rin, sapagkat lumabas na rin to sa dyaryo sa Amerika, eh, might as well um, tell that story kung bakit si Michael Armacos may personal na galit kay Mrs. Marcos. Well, Michael Armacos used to play tennis when he was ambassador here. And he was playing tennis with um, with a beauty queen. Okay? And there was, uh, it was an open secret or mayroon chismis na May labi-labi yan dun sa former beauty queen. As a matter of fact, a title holder yan. Miss Universe or something. Anyway, so ganun. Meron siyang, uh, meron siyang ano, uh, extramarital affair. Lumabas yan sa dyaryo sa Amerika. Hindi ko to iniimbento. Lumabas yan. Hahanapin ko yung dyaryo, babasahin ko sa inyo. At ang nagkataon, nagkaroon ng isang parang steak dinner sa, Malac- sa Malacanang. So lahat ng mga... Diplomatic Corps, imbitado. Michael Armacos is invited. Eh, yung isang katenis, itong beauty queen na ito, yun ang uh, tawag nito, deputy ni Mrs. Marcos sa Metro Manila Administration. Yung deputy niya si Ismael Matay. Uh, may his soul rest in peace. But he was also part of the tennis team na kalaro niya si Michael Armacos at saka itong beauty queen na ito. So, ang ginawa ni, Ma- ni Matay, Walang ka, si, I, I don't know why he did this pero sinama niya yung beauty queen na yon dun sa dinner okay ngayon dun sa presidential table kung, mang, sa pag-upo syempre andun si uh, Ambassador Armacos, Mrs. Armacos nakita ni Mrs. Armacos yung beauty queen kasi nakakadinig na siya ng chismis eh, na merong, merong affair yung kanyang asawa nakita niya tumayo siya at bigla siyang tumayo at umalis. So, nagulat si yung ambassador. 
tumayo siya. Yung pala, kasi nakita nga, nakita yung si Beauty Queen. Si Mrs. Marcos, nagtaka, walang kamalay-malay si Mrs. Marcos noon. Eh, syempre, siya yung, she's the hostess in that state, in that dinner, so she stood up. Sinundan nila si Mrs. R. Marcos sa patakbo na palabas na ng pababa na ng hagdanan at pababa na rin yung ambassador, yung asawa niya. Parang pinipigilan siya. At si Mrs. Marcos din, ang nagulat, sabi niya, what is this, what is happening? Ganun. Hinarap siya ni Armacos. Anong sinabi ni Armacos sa kanya? You will remember this night because you'll pay for this. Yun ang simula. Akala ni Ambassador Armacos, sinadya ni Mrs. Marcos. Yun ang galit niya. Yan. Binibigyan ko yung story niya sa background. Hindi ito chismis. Nalabas ito sa dyaryo. Sinulat ito. Yung, 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 yung incident na yan at kinwento nga na ganun nga ang nangyari. Kaya may galit. Yan si Armacos. Nung siya ay natapos na yung kanyang tur uh, tour of duty dito sa Pilipinas, pagbalik niya sa Amerika, naging uh, assistant secretary of state na siya for Asian Pacific Affairs. Eto na. Yan na daan nangyari. Kaya panahon na ni Cory, nakaisip na siyang gumante. Kaya nung natalo yung kanilang kaso sa, sa regional, sa, sa, <laughs> hindi regional, sa, uh, sa lower court, regional trial court dito sa Pilipinas yan. Sa lower court dito kay Mariana Feltzer, yung judge, Natalo sila doon. Binasa ko sa inyo ito several times. Nag-intercede si Michael Armacos. Kasi pala, yung deal pala ng Amerika, ng bureaucracy ng Washington, this is not American policy. Ha? This is the bureaucracy of Washington. And this is under George Shultz, yung sa State Department. Ang deal pala nila ay yung protection ng bases. Kaya yun ang kanilang hinahabol kay Mrs. Aquino. Kasi you must remember, prior to the... Um, prior to Mrs. Aquino filing her certificate of candidacy, candidacy, meron siyang grupo na tinatawag na conveners group. And they signed a document. And in that document, doon nakalista kung ano ang gagawin when Mrs. Aquino assumes power. So talagang na naniniguro na sila na lahat sila ay uh, uh, susundin kung ano yung pinag, pinag, uh, pinagkasunduan. Yung conveners group na yan. Meron din akong kopya niyan. Pirimahan nilang lahat at isa sa mga nakasulat doon, tatanggalin ang American bases. Kasi andun nga sila, sa longa, lahat yung mga yan, mga ultranationalist nga, etc. Meron doon nakasulat. One of the numbers there na naka, nakasulat doon na pirimahan ni Mrs. Aquino at lahat ng kasama niya, sila Ong Pin, lahat ng yan sa conveners group ay tatanggalin ang mga bases. Siyempre, alam ng Amerika yan. Kaya nililigawan nila si Mrs. Aquino na huwag, siya, huwag niyang tuparin, huwag niyang ipatupad kung ano yung pinirmahan niya kasi yun nga ang kanilang deal. So yung deal doon, sige, ikukulong namin si Marcos at si Imelda, basta yung basis huwag mo tatanggalin. Yun ang kanilang exchange deal. Okay? So ang nangyari dyan, natalo yung kaso ng Rico case sa LA, nag-appeal. Bakit? Kasi nag-intercede yung former ambassador Michael Armacos. At yan si Armacos may galit kasi personal ang kanyang galit kay Mrs. Marcos. So they went on appeal. They appealed in the Ninth Circuit Court of LA. Court of Appeals na yan. Dinig, dininig yung kaso na yon Babasahin ko sa inyo yung mga portions ng decision ng Court of Appeals. Natalo na naman ang Justice Department ng Amerika, dyan sa Rico case na yan sa LA, at natalo rin ang PCGG kasi sila ang nagbigay na mga dokumento na, hindi pala mga dokumento, I'm sorry, yung mga dyaryo. Okay. So ito yung sinabi ng court. On October 3, 1986, biruin nyo, within the year, ha? February pa lang naupo si Mrs. Aquino, nauna na yung executive order na yan. <coughs> Excuse me, March, April, May, In October, ito yung nakalagay sa kanilang decision. On October 3, 1986, the Philippine government argued and submitted its appeal in case number 86-6091 and 86-6093 DC number CV-86-3859-2020. Yan, si Mariana Feltzer yan. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit with Circuit Judges Nelson Hall 
and Kozinski rendered their decision. Tandaan niyo yung mga pangalan kasi record dito talaga sa LA. The following points in digest forms are the findings of the court. Ito, number one. Quotation marks itong binabasa ko. The Filipino Revolutionary Government of Madame Corazon Aquino provides no direct evidence to support its litany of offenses alleged to have been committed by Mr. Marcos. The only knowledge of these facts comes from countless newspaper and first-hand hearsay accounts relating to them. The Aquino government claims that practically everything that the Marcoses must own have been stolen and therefore belongs to the Philippines. It alleges through a sworn statement of its representative, ito pala yung first name, Fernando, ako Fernando. So it alleges through its sworn statement of its representative, Rafael Fernando, that there were bribes, kickbacks, interest in business ventures, and other things of value in exchange for the grant of government favors, contracts, licenses, franchises, loans, and at the same time, expropriating outright private property for the benefit of persons beholden to or fronting for Mr. Marcos, and the said expropriation being in times affected by violence or the threat of violence or incarceration and the direct raiding of the public treasury. Yan ang sinampah ng government ni Mrs. Aquino. The court, in answering this claim, issued a ruling that Mr. Fernando provides no direct evidence to support this litany of offenses and his only knowledge of these facts comes from countless newspaper and first-hand hearsay accounts relating to them, relating to the newspapers. The court, citing the case of Hatch versus Bias, ito yung decision sa America, 7 HUN 600, ruled that in fact, that the defendant has ceased to be president does not destroy his immunity. That springs from the capacity in which the acts were done or protects the individual who did them because they emanated from a foreign and friendly government. Paragraph 29. That's the last paragraph. The court concluded that the heart of the case was the assertion of the plaintiff Aquino government and the district court's assumption that all of the Marcos assets must have been stolen. It concluded that the claim and the cause of action of the Aquino government is dismissed under the Act of State and Political Question doctrines and under either of these doctrines, the plaintiff Aquino government's claim collapses and with it, its probability of success on the merits. Yan. Kinote nila dito yung case of Underhill versus Hernandez, 168 U.S. 250, 252, 1987 case under the Act of State Doctrine. Yan. So makikita ninyo yan ang decision. Sinabi nga dito, in order to resolve these various claims against Marcos, the court will have to adjudicate whether Marcos' actions as president were lawful under Philippine law. Yun. Kaya kailangan, ang sinabi nga, Dito sa Pilipinas, kailangan litisin. So, tuloy ko itong sinabi dito. The court also, ito ha, this is also part of the part of the decision. The court also rejected the claim of the Aquino government that the act of state go uh, doctrine has no force and effect because it is the Philippines itself that is asking the court to look into the actions of its former ruler. The court stated, ito, ito yung sinabi ng court. We cannot shut out, shut our eyes to the political realities that give rise to this litigation, not nor to the potential effects on his conduct and resolution. Mr. Marcos and Mrs. Aquino represent only two of the competing political factions engaged in a struggle for control of the Philippines. While the struggle seems to be resolving itself in favor of Mrs. Aquino, this is, this, this may be the end of the, this is not, may be the end of the matter. Only four years ago, the tables were turned with Mr. Marcos in power 
and Mrs. Aquino and her husband in exile here in the United States. While we are in no position to judge these things, we cannot rule out the possibility that the pendulum will swing again or that some third force will prevail. Ayan. So, makikita ninyo, yun ang decision ng Court of Appeals ng LA. Mr. Bautista, yung kaso na yan, PCGG, ikaw, naging chairman ka ng PCGG. When you assume your office, you have to understand the history also of that office. And you should have, you should have read this case. That's one. Second, this case was also filed. Rico case was also filed in New York. Ito, kailangan alam mo rin. Kasi sinabi mo sa interview, tingnan ninyo, ang perang ninakaw sa bayan ni ng mga Marcos na kabili ng mga apat na real estate dito sa New York. Para kang hindi abogado. At hindi mo tiningnan kung ano yung kaso na yan. Three months and a half yung trial na yan. Araw-araw. 350,000 documents. Galing din sa PCGG. Galing din sa inyong opisina. Galing sa mga banko. Galing sa mga nakuha ng Amerika. Sa mga Marcoses kung sila dumating sa Honolulu. Galing sa mga iba't ibang dokumento nakuha nila sa Malacanian. Pag-alis ng mga Marcoses. Kayo rin yan. Yan. Si Joker Arroyo at yung PCGG. Kayo may hawak yan. Kayo, opisina mo. Mr. Bautista. At ikaw na upo dyan as chairman. All of these documents presented that presented there in the trial in New York. You had 95 witnesses also that were there. Bakit sila sa longga hindi naging witness? Ewan ko lang. Bakit ikaw? Hindi ka rin humarap doon. Kasi kayo ang nakaupo sa opisina na yan. Why not point your finger and accuse Mrs. Marcos of having stolen the money of the Filipino people if you're so sure of it? If you have 350,000 documents, sabi ko nga pagpapasok ng prosecutor sa loob ng courtroom, hindi nga briefcase ang dala eh. Ang dala niya, grocery cart. Yung ginagamit ninyo pag nagsya-shopping kayo, pag namimili kayo ng grocery, malaki. Ganong kadaming papel, papeles, ang kanilang dinadala araw-araw sa korte. At ilang tao ang kanilang pinaupo sa witness stand? 95. Mr. Bautista, you should know that. Did the Marcoses present a single document? No. Did they present a single witness? No. In fact, The defense of President Marcos and Mrs. Marcos used your own documents. Yung documents na pinresent nila, ginamit, bakit? To prove that there was not a single one of them that could show that there was money taken from the Filipino people. You should know that, Mr. Bautista. So stop saying that the Marcoses were st stealing the money of the Filipino people to buy those buildings in New York. Nalitis na yan, nang gusto, sa araw-araw. I was there. I read those documents, I listened to those witnesses, I wrote about it, and I can talk about it as factually and as truthfully as I am sitting here. Why am I answering this? Because you are there seated with this lady who made this documentary against Mrs. Marcos, the kingmaker, na sinasabi nga na ayan, huwag na silang babalik sa Malacanang sapagkat kin uh, kinuha nila lahat ng pera ng taong bayan. My goodness! You have no right, Mr. Bautista, to even say it. Precisely because you sat in that office. Tapos sa Comelec, anong ginawa mo? Nagkaroon ng maraming investigasyon tungkol sa ginamit na Smartmatic. Saka na natin pag-uusapan yung Comelec na pag-upo mo. Pero ito yung, kasi yung interview sa'yo, hindi naman tungkol sa Comelec. Yung interview sa'yo, tungkol nga sa sinasabi mong nakaw na yaman ng mga Marcoses. And then, ito talaga... I'm sorry kung nagiinit ang ulo ko dito because this is really the, the face of a liar and the face of a hypocrite, really, if I have to say it. Because, eto, nagkaroon ng isang salo-salo, a gathering, I don't know even if it is a party or whatever, but he was invited. May kaibigan si Mrs. Marcos na kaibigan itong si Andres Bautista. In, kasama siya sa ininvita doon sa condominium ni Mrs. Marcos dyan sa Pacific Plaza. Okay. At andun siya. Nakisalo-salo siya, kumain siya, nakipag-usap kay Mrs. Marcos at lahat. Pagkatapos nakita niya dun sa likod ng isang sofa sa sala ni Mrs. Marcos, meron dalawang painting. Actually, maraming paintings. Eh. Hindi, hindi na lang niya siguro na-identify yung iba pa. 
Merong isang Picasso at saka merong isang painting doon. Si Mrs. Marcos pa nga ang nagsabi sa kanya, oh, this is by this painter. And yes, that is a Picasso. It's an original. So, ang ginawa ni itong si Andres Bautista, pa picture-picture, kunyari, dun sa ano, sa harapan ng mga painting na yon kunyari, pa posing posing May intention siya na kukunin yung mga painting sa yon Kasi sabi nga niya, sinabi rin niya sa interview, because they're subject of the litigation. Mr. Bautista, you should read Executive Orders 1, 2, 12, and 12A. Because your office, the PCGG, has only up to a certain period to have the authority to sequester and to file cases. May deadline kayo yung opisina mo. It doesn't mean to say na forever pwede yung litisin ang mga Marcoses. May deadline by your own law. And yet, you claim that the reason why you were interested in those paintings because they're subject of litigation. Anong litigation ang pinag-uusapan mo? That was when? Two, three years ago? Tapos na. Expired na yung authority ninyo. As a matter of fact, even before the PCGG was transferred to the Department of Justice, during the time of Mrs. Arroyo even, wala na kayong karapatan na maghabul pa. You mean to tell me na pagbibili ng laruan, halimbawa, ito mga anak ni uh, ito mga anak ni Mrs. Marcos, bibili sila ng laruan para sa kanila mga anak. Pati yon lilitisi ninyo kasi Marcos ang bumibili nun. There is a deadline to this, even, you know, common sense. Not even legally, but common sense. May katapusan yan. At nakalagay din sa inyong batas mismo. Kung hanggang kailan lang kayo pwede mag-sequester at kung hanggang kailan lang kayo pwede mag-file ng kaso. Hindi ibig sabihin na pag meron kayong madiskubre Halimbawa sa rural bank ng Tayabas o rural bank ng Gihinatilan, meron kayo nakita ang deposito doon mga Marcos, kukunin pa ninyo sa tapaw na panahon na ngayon. 35 years after 1986, 50 years after the Marcoses were in power. Ano ba yan? You must excuse me for sounding like this, but I expected more. And then, dinugsong niya ang nangyari. Parang sinabi niya na, Kaya siya umalis ng Pilipinas kasi hinaharas daw siya. Without saying kung sino nagaharas sa kanya. Anong sabi niya? Lumipad siya ng Amerika for a while kasi pinanood daw niya yung uh, presidential election sa Amerika. Pagbalik daw niya, parang dinugsong niya eh. Doon sa paglilitis niya kay Mrs. Marcos. Pagbalik daw niya, ay hinaharas na siya. Pagpasok daw niya sa apartment niya, Uh, nakahalungkat yung kanyang ano, nakabukas yung kanyang vault bukas yung kanyang mga aparador yung mga dokumento niya nakakalat may mga gwardya at yung kanyang, yung kanyang computer na hack, binuksan at kung anong pinagagagawa parang pinalalabas niya ng mga tao ng mga Marcoses ang gumawa nito Mr. Bautista kaya ka umalis sapagkat ang asawa mo mismo ang nagsalita she went public and this was, this was on air this was on print And this was on television, on radio, she was interviewed. And a lot of people were reading this, watching her saying that you, Mr. Bautista, got money and kept it, were paid during your stint in the Comelec, or paid somewhere, and that you have a lot of money, and that you're not supporting your wife. Ang kaso na yan, yung asawa mo ang mismong nag, ang nag-file ng kaso laban sa iyo. That was why your computer was open, your your cabinet lahat. Kasi kinwento nung, kinwento nung asawa mo, pinakita niya eh. This was shown on television. We all watched this and we were surprised because we were thought you were happily married and you know, you look like a good couple. Yung pala, meron kang tinatago. And you had a deposit somewhere in a rural bank in some remote town. Ilang milyon-milyon. And this came out because your wife said so. And she made she made testament. Uh, uh, she had documents and she she had affidavits regarding this. I don't know what happened to that case. Baka binigay mo na yung yung parte niya kasi sabi niya nung asawa niya, you, you know, half of that should go to me rightfully or something something to that effect. Baka nabayaran mo na rin kaya natigil na yan. But that is why you're in America. That is why sabi sabi mo nga kaya ako umalis kasi hinaharas ako. My goodness, Mr. Andres Bautista, how could you lie straight? in front of the television in that manner. <laughs> the Filipino people were witness to all of this. We saw it. We saw what happened to your apartment. We saw your wife talking. 
Of course, you were denying all of that, etc. But the, Mrs. Marcus and the Marcuses had absolutely nothing to do with that. You were not being harassed because there were Picasso paintings that you wanted to get from the apartment of Mrs. Marcos. Ay, nako. Mr. Bautista. Ang lungkot talaga. Di ba? Nagkakaganyan ang mundo. But there is nothing like the truth, really. And I keep on repeating this. I think it was President Marcos who mentioned this to me. The truth is like a diamond. The more you chisel it, the brighter it shines. And here I am repeating myself every time you have the Rita Gadi Hour. Because I've talked about this already before, but this is a new, a new episode. Because you have the chairman of the PCGG himself, former chairman, talking like this. A lawyer and supposed to be a brilliant man, connecting what has happened to his life as being harassed to Mrs. Marcos. You know, because he's, he saw a Picasso painting in her apartment and in, in her condominium and he wanted to continue the litigation against her. Ay, naku po. My goodness. Anyway. So I wrote here many things also because then perhaps this would clarify a lot of things. But then as I've said, I can only speak because I have the documents. I can talk about it because I've read all of this. I can talk about the people who talked about this because I listened to them. And this is not just hearsay. I recorded it as they were talking there on, on trial as witnesses. And even the court records would bear me out j just exactly as I've read even the court records from L.A., which was in 1987, 86 and 87. So here we have this lady who made this uh, documentary, as she would call it, or this film about Imelda Marcos. And she did not go through the documents that Mrs. Marcus was showing her. It is one, one whole bodega. You know, Miss uh, Green, Greenfield. Ganda pa naman ang pangalan mo. Miss Greenfield, you went, I saw, I saw the video. I saw a video clip of you going over, looking at those documents and Imelda was showing you. Those are the 350,000 documents, madam, or Miss Greenfield, that uh, she was able to get back from the court. In fact, she paid for them. She had to pay the um, District Court of New York, the court of uh, John F. Keenan, Keenan, to be able to get those documents back. Lahat ng ginamit laban sa kanya, binili niya from the court. Para yan ang nakalagay dyan sa kanyang bodega. It's not really a bodega. It's actually one whole room, one whole building. Or, or It's not even a building. Basta isang malaking bodega. Very neatly arranged, as a matter of fact. And if you, Miss Greenfield, looked over them carefully, then you would see that uh, these were the documents, all 350,000 of them, that were used against Imelda Marcos, and then not one. You should have asked her, is there one document here, one page? Show me, Mrs. Marcos, that would be able to show that you stole money from the Filipino people, or your president stole, or your husband, Ferdinand Marcos, stole the money of the Filipino people. Kasi lahat yan documented. And it was accepted as evidences in the court in America. And yon. So, Miss Greenfield, why did you not ask Mrs. Marcus if there was one document there? And you keep on claiming that uh, she has all this money, uh, you know, that she can buy anything she wants, etc. That's exactly the defense Jerry Spence said. It is not a crime to be rich. It is not a crime to buy those four buildings in New York. It is a crime that... She loved President Marcos to his death, and that is what I am defending. Yun ang sinabi nga ni Jerry Spence. In court, in open court, before the jury. So, Miss Greenfield, you went over those documents, or at least you, you lived through them. You were walking through them. You should have asked. Instead of you now, in that interview, saying that, you know, the, Mrs. Marcos had this extravagant lifestyle, etc., and all of that. Anyway. So, it is very clear... You know, I, I'm quoting what, what they said, what you and Bautista said. It is very clear that a lot of money, you know, was taken out of the treasury. Mr. Bautista, you're saying this? Remember, when Mrs. Aquino took over, the Marcoses had no access to the budget that was still there. The documents were there. They had no access to all the documents that were there in the Philippine government. You had access to this. So, you would say that a lot of money was taken from the treasury. What is the treasury? 
You had the documents of the treasury. Mr. Bautista, you're saying it was taken out of the treasury. Did you check in the treasury if there was one document at all? Or anybody working in the treasury? You could testify. You could have taken any person there to have testified in New York to say, I actually saw President Marcos steal money from the treasury. Uh, verbally and, and, you know. And then what else was said there? You know, sabi nga ni, ano, ni, ni Bautista, that the shoes were just a distraction daw. Kasi ang pera, ang dami-dami. Mas maraming nidakaw. Kaya yung shoes, ano lang daw yun. Anyway, can you imagine... 10 billion dollars daw ang ninakaw sa taong bayan. Where is the proof? Where is the evidence, Mr. Bautista? And then he's mentioning, kasi ang sweldo daw nila Marcos at nila Imelda, ganun lang, kapirangot. They had a salary which was um, very little compared to the billions and billions in those accounts, etc., and all of those banks. But of course. But do we know where that money came from? That's exactly what the judge in New York said. You bring this celebrated case into my courtroom and then you tell me, gee, we can't find the documents. The exact words. Memoriado ko. Because for me, that was the clincher. John F. Keenan, district judge of the trial of Imelda in New York, the Rico case. That's exactly what he told Charles Labella, the prosecutor. He took over Giuliani, remember? Giuliani never prosecuted Mrs. Marcus. He just made an announcement that he would jail Mrs. Marcos. Pero nag na siya to run as mayor of New York City. Natalo siya when he ran for New York City. Anyway, yun ang sinabi ng judge. You bring this celebrated case into my courtroom and when you receive the fancy ornaments from the tree, you come to my court and say, gee, we can't find the documents. Ano ibig sabihin nun? Hindi makahanap ng dokumento na nagsasabi nagnakaw sa taong bayan. Well, Miss Greenfield and Mr. Bautista, I've just answered you. I don't know how far this Rita Gadi hour would go, but wherever it is and whatever it will reach people, I am reciting exactly court documents and the facts of the case, and I lay my case before you. It is not for any judgment. It's simply to say that, well, I've always repeated this, the truth is very easy to tell. It is only evil that complicates. Thank you for having joined me. This is Rita Gadi for your hour.